Welcome to the Seed and Biodiversity Forum, a project of the Reskilling Expo. I work as a farm inspector for organic farms and policy person for CCOF and have been uh, in the past a farmer and a seed saver for many years. When I first started gardening back in the 70s and early 80s, uh, the only place I knew to get seeds was from the seed rack in my hardware store or from the Burpee catalog, which was the only catalog that I'd really ever heard of to get seeds. And so I ordered a lot of seeds from Burpee and I noticed over the years that a couple years I'd open the catalog and my favorite variety wouldn't be there anymore. <coughs> and luckily, um, I still had some seeds left in the packet. And so I planted those and saved them for seed. And I, the first thing I undertook to do was uh, deer tongue lettuce, which had, was dropped from the Burpee catalog in the late 70s. And I started wondering what happened to those seeds? Where did they go uh, when they were no longer in the Burpee catalog? <clears throat> and um, if I didn't save my own seed, would I be able to ever get them again? Well, um, in 1982, I moved from Santa Barbara area where I had been uh, gardening up to that point up to Tehama County north of Chico. And the, uh, I started farming with some friends. The climate is very different up there. It, it, it's very hot um, as it is in the Central Valley. And so many of the seeds which I had been uh, growing and collecting in Santa Barbara weren't appropriate for up there. So we started um, asking around our neighbors and um, experimenting to see what seeds would be the best for that uh, very particular, very hot climate that we lived in. And in the course of doing so, we came across a gentleman by the name of Laverne Branstedt, who um, was our electrician. He was doing some electrical work. Um, but he had been uh, growing a melon that he had saved from his friend who was a farmer named Joe Stutz, and the melon was called the Stutz Supreme. Joe had discovered this melon in his field during World War II as an off-type in a cantaloupe field, and um, found that it did very well in the valley because it didn't sunburn like most Crenshaw-type melons are prone to do there, and tasted really delicious and was extremely well adapted there. Laverne was well into his 80s and was planting this melon in the back of his property so that it wouldn't cross with other melons and traipsing out there with this watering can every uh, so often to try and keep it alive. So he gave us the seed and he was very glad to have some young people to turn it over to um, who could take better care of it since he was getting on. <coughs> we grew those melons and they were the most delicious melons you've ever tasted. And it was then that we realized what a responsibility we had been given along with the seed. So at that point, I started looking for other people to um, share seeds with, and I came across the Seed Savers Exchange, um, which is a national organization. And in 1982, there were only a couple of hundred people uh, in it. I discovered that um, lots of people had seeds that they had been passed down in their families for generations had come through in their uh, cultural traditions, and they were all struggling to keep them pu pure and were hap happy to exchange them with other people. <coughs> so I started um, exchanging seeds with them, and none of them were as good as our melon was, <coughs> but there were many very, very worthwhile seeds um, that were out there and not available in seed catalogs. It turns out that um, at the time I was wondering what happened to those seeds, <clears throat> that were dropped from the seed catalogs. I wasn't the only one wondering that. Kent and Diane Whaley, who founded the Seed Savers Exchange, were also wondering the same thing. And they actually undertook to do a survey of all the seed companies in the United States and Canada to see what the trends were in seed variety availability. And they did this. Uh, the first survey was published in 1984. They found 237 seed companies. When they compared this list to the last time a survey had been done, the last survey before that had been done in 1903 by the U.S. government. And they found only 3% of the varieties in 1984 were still available that had been available in the 1903 list. <coughs> so uh, genetic um, preservation is extremely important and our genetic diversity is decreasing um, at a very rapid rate. 
um, Kent found in the first uh, survey, which w resulted in a publication called the Garden Seed Inventory, that 48% of all the varieties listed were only listed by one company, meaning if that company dropped it, then um, where did it go? It was gone, or amateur seed savers like us were the only ones keeping it going. It's since 1984, it's become even more and more critical because um, as is the corporatization of everything in the world, seed industry is being corporatized at an alarming rate and the big companies and many of which are pharmaceutical companies are buying out the small family owned seed companies and uh, we are in danger of losing a great deal more genetic diversity if we don't do something about it. Fortunately, though, it's one of the easiest examples of we can think globally about the big picture, but we can do something about it in our backyard. And so we're going to hear today from the panelists who will talk about both backyard and bigger solutions to the genetic diversity and genetic preservation problems. I'm the food and farming director for Bioneers, and Bioneers uh, works in a variety of ways, uh, Bioneers conference, radio series, uh, book series and other projects to educate people and to catalyze positive change at the intersection of social justice, uh, ecological restoration, and food and farming. So tonight I'd like to suggest three ways to preserve diminishing genetic resources. Number one, grow, eat, and market crops and foods that are at risk. I had the privilege to work with John Mohawk, a turtle clan Seneca from the Cataragas Reservation in western New York on the Iroquois White Corn Project. John's vision was to reintroduce this traditional food to his community, which like many native communities, is suffering from uh, diabetes at epidemic levels. Iroquois white corn, the traditional staple that had kept Iroquois people healthy and vibrant for centuries, is, actually, is a slow release carbohydrate and actually prevents diabetes. I worked with John to set up a small milling operation and find markets for the Iroquois white corn and to encourage uh, native farmers to grow their traditional crop. And in doing so, uh, we had the corn listed on the Slow Food Arc of Taste, uh, which promotes foods that are at risk of being lost. Number two, identify foods and crops that are at risk and gather the stories that go with them. Uh, another Bioneers project that I'm working with is Dreaming New Mexico, envisioning and implementing a local food shed at the state level. I conducted a series of video interviews to collect the traditional knowledge of Native American and Hispano farmers and, and the traditional knowledge uh, and gather the stories of the biocultural crops of New Mexico. And later tonight, I think if there's time, I'll show a, a video with some excerpts from those interviews. Uh, we mapped the main points of cultural significance for crops like blue corn, Amarillo Norte bean, Azuni tomatillo, Taos pea, Chimayo chili, and others. And I have a copy of that mapping if anybody's interested after the presentation to take a look. When I interviewed Estefan Ariano, who traces his family lineage back to the first Spanish caravan that entered New Mexico in 1598, he said, all the traditional seeds are like brothers and sisters. It was mostly the women who kept the seeds. My mother would tell me that she had to trade seeds with my tia from Okeawinge every five years to keep rotating the seeds to invigorate them with seeds from the different waters, Rio Mbudo, Rio Grande, Rio Santa Cruz, and Rio Chama. So number three is exchanging seeds is very important. Each year at the Bioneers Conference, I organize a seed exchange where about 400 people share seed. This past year, um, we had Cecilio Tuyuk Sukuk, who works with the Maya Seed Arc Project, helping to promote food security in the Maya region by establishing seed banks to protect and distribute traditional seeds. At the Bioneer Seed Exchange, uh, Cecilio got some amaranth seeds from Doug Gosling of Occidental Arts and Ecology Center and took them with other seeds back to Guatemala and started the first um, seed exchange in his region in his lifetime. When the local Maya saw the amaranth, which had been lost uh, to their region for decades, it was like seeing a long lost relative returning home some people cried at the sight of the amaranth seed. So my suggestions are to save seed, 
gather and share the stories about the seeds and food, and create your own stories by learning the practical skills and by promoting eco-literacy and appreciation for seeds and biodiversity. I practice uh, natural agriculture in uh, Bonnie Dune in Santa Cruz. So I cannot speak English very well, so that's, I create some slide. <laughs> so I'd, I'd like to explain a little bit our Shumei organization. Uh, Shumei organization is uh, a little bit a spiritual organization, basically. So Shumei means it's a bright light. So we yeah, hope in the bright light for in the, to the future. <laughs> Shumei Natural Agriculture uh, has been uh, provided uh, by Mokichi Okada in, from the 1935. So basically his philosophy is a respect for nature and comfort for the nature. So natural agriculture is uh, uh, an approach to the agriculture in which is a natural capacity in the wisdom of the nature uh, respected. It may be more than the system of the food production and the gathering, and we think it's way of life. So, human natural culture, uh, we don't use any in the fertilizer, also herb, uh, herbicide, and then animal manure also. So, uh, we export and fertilizer meth. Uh, we don't use any uh, fertilizer. You don't have to use in the, any fertilizer. This is uh, our, uh, you know, more activity for the sharing and our philosophy. We believe soil has a spirit its own, uh, of its own. It naturally has the power to grow plants uh, without anything being added. So when we human being give to the uh, soil, uh, soil love and daily care, and we are able to harvest what we need, we think about. So we also believe uh, seeds uh, has a spirit its own. And it may have, it may have uh, some information where it grows. And also it might have a good germination uh, at the natural agriculture seed. I just recommend it to the everybody, so let's save and see. <laughs> I'm honored to be here. I almost feel like uh, uh, there's so many people who are so, which much higher qualifications than I have, but I will do my best here. Um, so um, I was the I come at this from uh, the rare fruit growers. So I'm a member of the rare fruit growers, and I was the vice president of the uh, Monterey Bay chapter of the rare fruit growers uh, last year. And um, I, I have one really, really selfish motive: my belly. And I think that's really the fundamental driver behind biodiversity um, because I, I can tell you when we have, every year we have sign exchanges in the California rare fruit growers. And you do not stand between a rare fruit grower and a sign wood. It's a very dangerous thing to do. People are going there to, to get a hold of their favorite fruit varieties. And these are mostly varieties that you cannot actually buy. You can't get them from nurseries. They're, they're, they're relatively obscure. But people in the, in, in the group know about them. So I'm going to start by passing around this uh, lemon just to make, the, make my point. Somebody can come and grab that from me. Scratch and sniff. Um, this is a Sicilian lemon, which is extraordinary. Um, and it's worth to actually go out of your way to try to get a hold of it and, and grow it. It doesn't, it, it, it's very different in flavors. And it's actually called Limonaria Fino. And they actually make the limoncello out of it in Italy. Um, so it's a very good lemon. Uh, so I, I firmly believe that one of the elements to get biodiversity going, uh, and the same applies with seeds, is to actually make that connection between, uh, you know, between food and, and these plants and, and their value from that perspective. So that's the first thing. The second thing is I, I actually run a website called the Cloud Forest Gardener. It's www.cloudforest.com. And every spring, um, my wife, who's in the audience, can attest to it. The grafting ritual starts. And what happens is I actually get flooded with packages from people requesting 
something out of my collection. In return, I usually get something out of their collection. So the internet is a tremendous medium to do this sort of thing and to exchange information with people. So people come onto the forum and they ask questions, they want to know how to grow things, and they ask other people, wow, what's really good? All of these things also, we, we exchange mostly sign wood, but we also exchange seeds for fruits. For example, um, this is a tree tomato, which is actually a, uh, it, it's a, it, it kind of tastes like a tomato and a passion fruit combined together. It's quite unique. Um, I'm glad to pass that one around too. People can take a look. Um, and, uh, and so that works very well. So, uh, there, so there's really three elements here that when you think about it, there's food, the internet, and then there's actually getting people together because that's what really works with the California rare fruit growers. We have a tremendous amount of diversity uh, uh, within the group in terms of what people grow in their backyards. I happen to have 600 varieties of apples. Yes, I have a little bit of an obsessive <laughs> trait which gets me going on that, so it's a little bit of a collector bug that I have. I also have lots of other things growing there, including Andean uh, uh, fruits that are relatively obscure, and uh, I also have unusual vegetables from the Andes. They're little funky-looking potatoes called ulocos, and I have a thing called yacon. So there's just a richness of, of amazing foods out there, and you can make all kinds of stuff with them. Uh, so that's really, really what motivates me, and I'm sure it's going to motivate many people in the audience, too, to want to participate. My name is Renee Shepard, and I actually own a local seed company called Renee's Garden. I used to have a mail order catalog called Shepard's Garden Seed. Renee's Garden sells seeds over the Internet directly to home garden, and we also sell seeds at garden centers and nursery. We're well represented locally here, but also nationwide. My roots are local. I got most of the advice to start my company from people up at Camp Joy, Beth Benjamin, who used to work with me, and Jim Nelson, who used to run the UCSC farm. I represent the commercial side of seeds, I think. Um, I buy seeds probably from companies large and small all over the globe. If you go to a regular seed catalog, you are actually doing a very ecumenical act because, for example, for my small company, we buy seeds from Germany and Israel, Italy, France, Spain, Morocco, uh, Peru, Chile, Argentina, Korea, South, uh, South Korea, China, Vietnam, Thailand, pretty much all over the world. Seed companies like mine, our job is to test them. I try and test them in all different climates to make sure they grow well all over and then sell them to home gardeners who will enjoy growing them. It's true that there is a lot less diversity, but coincidentally, uh, I am uh, in a capitalist country, and I have to say that there's a lot of pluralistic capitalism also happening in the seed industry. There are more small seed companies started up now than there have been in 30 years. I'm uh, on the board of the Home Garden Seed Association. We have more small members of small companies that have started up to sell seeds, many of them heirloom to folks like yourself. There are more heirloom seeds in commerce now in home garden than there ever has before. Ironically, the one huge company, the one home garden seed company that is owned by a large corporation is actually Seeds of Change, which is owned by Mars Bars. Frankly, the rest of us are still pretty much owned by individuals. In the vegetable seed trade, 98% of it is grown, tested, and bred for uh, commercial ends. The home garden seed industry is about 1.5% of the seed industry worldwide. It's a very small uh, group, and it's made up of all kinds and sizes of seed producers. So it's important to distinguish between the home garden seed industry such as it is, which has large, uh, you know, seeds are grown all over, and small, um, and, and, and I'm sorry, and commercial seed production. So, for example, and I, I also think that as a seed person selling seeds today to gardeners all over, I also want to make a case that just because a seed is old, it may have many valuable aspects, an interesting story, but there are much new breeding going on that has really good application for those of us who really like to save a lot of varieties of open pollinated seeds, but also get seeds that really work in our gardens. Uh, let me give you two quick examples. 
Um, everyone is probably familiar, for example, with rainbow chard. It's a beautiful chard. We've all grown it. You can buy it commercially now, and it comes in all different colors with stalks in orange and red and green and purple and white. Well, a new development I happen to sell the seeds is the very good small breeders have actually taken that and selected out and bred for single colors. So you now can get magenta. You can get gold and yellow chard. You can get all these different colors that have been isolated and saved. It's just traditional breeding and it's really fun if you're into having food that's beautiful as well as delicious. Also in the East two years ago many of us perhaps read about this terrible late blight disease that hit just about all the tomatoes on the eastern seaboard. Well, there are some breeders um, actually associated with the university that have bred a new hybrid which has disease resistance for late blight built into it. That's a huge boon if you are a small grower or home gardener in the east, you are now going to be able to save tomato seed with late blight resistance. This trait can be passed on. So there's a lot of exciting new things that are coming along too. So I think heirlooms are important. By the way, much of the heirloom seed that you buy from small heirloom companies is actually produced by a California company that grows heirloom seeds for commercial commercial distribution, and, um, and, and they're interesting and valuable. But don't, uh, don't pass up the possibility that diseasing, breeding for disease resistance or taste or particular quality still is being done and should be done so that everything old is new again, but everything new is also new. Okay. I'm a permaculturist. I attended a seed school recently. I'm a 12-year farmer, uh, five years in production, most recently at the Esalen Farm and Garden, last couple of years. And like it was said, you know, 96% in of the 1903 uh, list was not available now, right? As far as biodiversity goes. But like as Renee was saying, we have this incredible opportunity to experiment and to find the ways to create more diversity or get we some of these strains we've lost and we won't get them back. That's true. And there's all these companies that have consolidated and trying to take up all the um, seed rights of the seed, telling us what we should grow or how we should grow it. But we need to really celebrate the relationship that we have with the land. This is something that's been severed by these corporations in a certain way, like who here grows their own food, right? We're in Santa Cruz, we grow a lot of our own food, it's really beautiful here. A lot of people don't grow their own food and they don't have that connection. So one of the things I think that we can really do is find a way to reconnect with nature, reconnect with the land, and find the, um, the way through the seed is really the way that that can happen. Um, I'm a young farmer and I really, uh, my take home message I guess is to really support the young farmers that are out there because we have an incredibly hard challenge right now upon us. We've lost a lot of di biodiversity, but we're also in a time when there's seven billion people on the planet now. And the scale is, is one farmer growing 5,000 acres, right? But I'd like to suggest that we have, you know, a thousand farmers growing five acres. And what would that look like? That would be a much different, different application of scale. And so I think the biggest problem that we have right now is that we have this large scale industrial complex that has, you know, severed our relationship with nature. Not severed it so much, but displaced it a little bit. And whether it's one or ten generations, we need to find the way to get back to that agrarian root, um, agrarian roots that we have with our community. And it usually, it starts with the seeds, I believe, because they're the ones, um, whether it's in our own selves or the in the packets or the ones in our, that are growing in our gardens. It's the seeds that are going to uh, really be the future for our children, but also for the bees and the butterflies and all of the animals and plants, um, uh, critters, insects. It's not just for us that we're saving these seeds for, but for the whole biodiversity of life. I'm, I'm really honored to be here with these people and, and, their, and the passion that they have. My passion is, is uh, sometimes hard to, hard to um, put into words just because I realize that there's, it's an incredible challenge that we're up against right now because of uh, climate change and, and the loss of some of these species that would help get us out of it in some respects. Um, some of these ancient strains and ancient traits are crucial 
uh, for our for their survival, but for our survival in making through making it through some of these uh, these times. The Organic Seed Alliance and the Family Farmers Seed Co-op are both really great uh, resources that are out there now. There's all these seed companies, as Renee was saying, that are coming up, and a lot of young farmers that are excited about having fun and creating these bioregional seed banks. So. Uh, it's really exciting that it's happening here and that people are, you know, doing it in their own backyard because it really you don't need that much space to grow your own seeds and to share them with each other. Here's the question and I'll let any of our panelists who want to answer it. Do you see a threat from the Food Safety Modernization Act? The Food Safety Modernization Act um, was passed by Congress a couple of, I guess, two, three months ago now. And it u makes um, food safety requirements uniform across all the, the whole country. Uh, before that, uh, California had our own standards called the Leafy Green Marketing Agreement, which only applied to green vegetables and was a result of the uh, scare on, of E. coli on spinach several years ago. But now there has been a nationwide um, act passed it does have several exemptions for direct market farmers and smaller scale farmers that were put in by um, uh, Senator John Tester, who's the organic farmer member of Congress. I would just add that uh, I think any time we have a big, large uh, situation on our hands, like we do with the industrial agricultural um, model, that there's going to be uh, corporations and and laws and bylaws that are going to uh, try to control certain aspects of that. And I think we have this scale that's kind of out of hand. And so bringing it back down again to a more feasible scale, we wouldn't need some of these, uh, uh, these acts that are going into place. I do, I do see, though, that there's opportunity within these, these acts that if we're able to uh, take advantage of some of the things that are written in there, that we can, uh, we can actually make them work for us uh, rather than against us. However, it's a big scale that um, needs to be, I think, just downsized. I would add that the things we're all interested in are very political. And if you feel strongly about them, then you have to get political because national bills get passed. These amendments that uh, provide some exemptions for small growers were only in there because a lot of people spoke up. The last farm bill had, for the very first time, money for breeding for organic farmers. I just came back from seeing a lot of that research. It was only there because constituents made their voices known. So it's not good enough to just say, well, there's a huge monolithic structure run by the corporate enterprises and the government. It has nothing to do with me. You can affect it. You just got to participate. So uh, I think that the Food Safety Act is monolithic, and it's going to try and paint everything with the same color. There are some exemptions, and we're going to have to work to expand those exemptions and keep them in there. Much as we didn't like some of the uh, way things went down and had to fight really hard, as Renee said, to get exemptions for small farmers, it was really important to put some uniformity in at the national level, because what was happening was that um, buyers of products in California were writing their own standards, and those standards um, were way more strict than they absolutely need to be because they were all trying to go one up on each other, going, our food is even safer than your food. And many of the things they were putting in place were really antithetical to good organic practices for organic growers, like having 800 feet of bare ground between a river and your crops. Well, that is just, there's no science behind it. There, it's pure marketing hype. And so, um, while of course we're concerned that any big nationwide act, a one size fit all, is hard to implement, but um, the piecemeal approach to being overzealous about it wasn't really serving us very well either. Okay, the next question, would seeds from regions like Africa or India benefit us here? such as drought resistance or flood and mold resistant. Well, actually, here's a perfect example. This is the, <clears throat> this is the Rakoto pepper, and this actually comes from the uh, mountains in the Andes. Um, one thing that's very interesting is that um, Rakoto, by the way, there are some in the back if people are interested. One of the things that's interest interesting about the Rakoto peppers is that they come from a region in, in the Andean mountains where the climate is actually quite similar to the coastal region of California. 
Um, there's a band somewhere between about 8,000 and 10,000 feet down in uh, Ecuador and Peru, and it's where all the yummy fruits grow, like cherimoyas and whatnot, and avocados. Um, these guys grow there too, and these guys are distinct from the perspective that they're, they're not only, because they're so cold resistant, it's not that they're frost resistant, it's that they're cold resistant. When it gets chilly, they don't become more susceptible to diseases like the regular peppers do. So it's, there's much more disease resistance in them. And what that talks to is, is actually climate adaptability, which you can actually find in places like India if you go up to, uh, they've got a lot of mountains in India. And you get up to about 8,000, 9,000 feet in the tropics and you get such conditions that are similar to here. So the answer is a categorical yes, we would benefit hugely from be getting access to those genetic resources that are down there. Um, I personally have a big interest in Andean crops um, and a lot of the crops that come from Central and South America up at some elevations. Amaranth is actually an example of that. I've been working in New Mexico and I, I sort of alluded to that, but um, the chili pepper comes from Mesoamerica and it was brought up actually by the Spanish uh, to New Mexico. And uh, now it's an iconic crop for both Hispano and Native American farmers in places like New Mexico. And in, in uh, Mexico and Central America, Chile was, uh, that's a perennial. So Chile is actually, you know, a, a, a testimonial to the adaptation because once it got to New Mexico, high desert, it, it, it had to become adapted to a much shorter growing season as an annual. So, so um, the trading of genetic resources is, um, as, as Renee was saying, you know, heirlooms, you know, those are treasures, but this is a dynamic process, and it's always been a dynamic process. And, um, and uh, Axel is a great uh, example of, of how dynamic it is. The next question, how do you prioritize the seeds you save? We saving seed for the more popular for the people, popular seed. Uh, also, uh, maybe it's becoming more good, you can, uh, as you know, more tasty also and more strongly more around the uh, environment. So if you have saving seed, uh, it's very, you know, more uh, well, uh, more good, uh, you know, uh, character, good character they have maybe. You don't want to eat any, you know, uh, like a kind of a, a Japanese, uh, what, 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 so, <laughs> do you know what what kind of vegetable that's in the, you know in the market or in the farmers market? So <laughs> I don't want to you know uh, not popular one and uh, not so I I just uh, save things for more popular for sharing with people a uh, lot as much as possible. One of the things that gets me motivated to save seeds and uh, I've got drawers in my kitchen that are full of seeds. Um, is, is really coming from if I know that something is just not available, it gets me really motivated to, to stuff it away. And uh, it not only gets me motivated to stuff it away, but it also gets me motivated to distribute it. So I try to get it out to as many of my friends as possible. An example of that, I have an, a Peruvian herb called huatake. Um, and it's used in bean dishes down in Peru. Uh, down in the, it, it comes from the Arequipa region. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's like, it smells similar to marigold. And uh, I've got a whole bag back there and, and, and I'm actually scared to lose it because not that many people have this uh, around here. Um, now I wanna make a plug here for the catalogs too because I think that we really need to support uh, the smaller seed catalogs that are out there. Um, I don't think that we're supporting large evil corporations when we support uh, the, the smaller s commercial seed catalogs that are out there, and they're actually a key element to preserving biodiversity. Um, so I would probably try seeds according to, first of all, what's not available, and then, you know, if it's available from the seed companies, try to support the seed companies, because the more you buy from them, you know, the more successful they're going to be, and they're going to be able to make, those, make many more seed varieties available the more successful they are. The next question is for Renee. Um, regarding the importation of seed from other countries, to prevent, to prevent insects and disease from being imported 
with the seeds, are the seeds irradiated or other measures required by customs taken, and how does this affect the seeds? It is actually amazingly easy to import seed because every seed lot that is sent over comes with a, what's called a phytosanitary certificate, which is a statement that it's been inspected by an official from a local um, inspection agency for that country that belongs to an international um, certification program. No, uh, seeds are not irradiated. The only seeds that used to come in that were um, uh, fungicide treated were sweet pea seeds, but we have got around that by using FedEx, who seems to have never heard of the law. <laughs> um, but no, we, um, I think all garden seeds buy seeds from all over. And I certainly learned the hard way. I used to buy very fren fancy French har um, filet beans from a French company only to find out that they were grown in Idaho and sent to France and that I was importing them back. And, and I do think that point also about there are wonderful resources all over the world, um, seeds from every culture and every country, and the way to keep them in circulation is in fact you know, I think saving seeds is great, but also to keep them to keep them purchased and keep people growing them and having them available in commerce. I think there's many, many seeds that I am basically told by their producers, if you don't keep buying them, then I'm not going to produce them anymore. In other words, uh, there has to be a, a market economy for seed varieties. It can't all be privatized. Uh, and many seeds are also grown where they grow best. It's, it may seem very romantic to save all your own seeds, but you may be saving seeds in a, in a climate that those seeds don't really produce at their best germination and their um, most vigor. And it's better actually sometimes to have seeds grown where they do best and then have them traded and exchanged through the world. If I, I sell eggplant that's grown in Italy, I sell eggplant that's grown in Thailand, it's a Thai variety, and I sell Indian eggplant. And the same um, thrips attach, you know, attack them all. And if you can grow eggplant, you can grow eggplant pretty much from anywhere in the world. Some will be a longer season variety, some will be a shorter season variety. I, I don't really think that I, I've experienced what you're, what you're worried about. Uh, insects are kind of local, and your concern that they don't come in with crops is, of course, true, but seed is pretty clean. Uh, you really, most things we worry about are more like, more about rodents and rats, frankly. She asked about if pollinators are specific to plants um, that might be, um, not, not quite sure I'm really understanding your question, but um, I think that um, someone else is going to answer. So actually, it's interesting you bring that up. That <clears throat> there, it generally, generally, it's not an issue, but there are plants where that is an issue. Cherimoya, for example. The fruit cherimoya, which you can grow very well from seeds, by the way, and there's seeds on the back table from what I understand, um, is that there's a pollinator, a little insect, which I, right now the name escapes me, uh, that uh, is there in their native range in, in Ecuador and Peru, and it's not available here in the States. Um, and so what happens is the cherimoya growers actually have to hand pollinate uh, the fruit that way. Although now we have this lovely uh, cherry fruit fly, the Drosophilus, which has arrived, and it seems to love the cherimoya flowers, so it's changing things a little bit around. But uh, that's an issue, but it's usually an exception. And I would think that the seed companies have, have, have tested these varieties out and find out whether they work or not. My, gar my garden is filled with, with things that come from all over the world, and uh, they, if, it's usually more of a climate issue whether they're adapted to the climate, because if a, if a plant's not adapted to the climate, that will be a real challenge to actually get it to produce seed. You might get fruit, but the seed might not be viable. For example, if you go look around Santa Cruz, you see all those lovely um, uh, Washingtonia palms. It's a standard California fan palm. Well, it actually turns out it's too cold here for them to actually produce seed. They'll grow, but you'll never see them with big seed pockets. Whereas if you go out in the desert, you see these things are just loaded with seeds. So that's just an example. Yeah, I wanted to elaborate on that just a bit. Um, while the pests are not um, that much of an issue and um, um, what Axel was talking about is certainly correct, and pollinator, pollinators are not that much of an issue on most things, but there are horticultural differences when you move a seed, especially when you move it um, from the south near the equator where the days are a similar lengths to up north that can affect the production. So if you bring a corn, for instance, from down south and try to grow it at our latitude, it will grow 10 or 12 feet tall, but it will not uh, ever produce uh, fruit 
because it's not, um, it's day length sensitive, it's not acclimatized. And onions are, corn and onions are the two main vegetable crops that have features like that. If you buy them from a reputable seed company, however, they've already been tested in this area, and so you know that the seeds that you get there will work. But if you're going down there yourself and collecting seeds, that will be a factor. The next uh, question is a bit long. I appreciate the panelists and organizers for how this event is helping move this conversation forward. There are 90 people here now, and this is a rich diversity of businesses, farmers, and nursery managers, and civil society. What might happen if we did this regularly? How might that benefit the things you care about locally? I actually think it's a wonderful idea to start this because there's obviously a lot of people here are interested in this and, and we're all interested in the same thing. We, we like diversity in the kitchen and, and uh, you know, we should, we should I mean, I, I looked at the back table when I got here, I'm going, oh wow, this is kind of like a sign exchange. There's all this plant stuff back there. Um, you know, if, if we do decide to meet regularly, I do think that the back table should have more and more stuff to exchange. Yeah, I think we need to gather more and more um, in community and in, in as many ways as we can, especially out in the garden as well. And uh, the white packets back there are, is my like traveling seed collection, basically. I just kind of go where I go. And if we can start finding ways to share the the different plants that we love so much and find out and then exchange the information with them. That's the type of reconnection that we need to start having within our community because it's the information and the knowledge that goes along with the seed because I can give you a seed and it's just, you know, what does it need? It's like a person that needs, it's, it needs a community to grow with it, the soil and the animals and the plants and the people. So we need to gather ourselves but also gather in larger communities and then start sharing that knowledge more and more whether it's through the internet or, uh, or just in, in the Grange Hall. I just want to echo what um, Benjamin said. And um, so it's not just the seed that's being shared here, it's the information, right? And it's also, this is, this is, the, this is now the collection of a community biodiversity. And um, I, there's, a, there's an island up in uh, British Columbia that's known for its apple varieties. And, bef and um, I thought, I was very impressed with this uh, before I met Axel, actually, because they have 300 varieties. You have 600 varieties? <laughs> they have 300 varieties on the apple, and it's, and it's spread all, out, all, all over the island, right? And it's part of their um, literacy. There's a, huge, there's a very high apple literacy. So, so they have, each year they have an uh, apple fest. And they have a hall like this, about two or three times the size, and they put every, all 300 varieties, and everybody can look at them and taste them. And, and everybody from you know, the, the, the elders to the kids know what the varieties they like, know which ones are, are, are good for pies and juice. And, and so there's, a, there's just a great community knowledge about that, and that's what this is all about here, too. I want to just add one thing about the community aspect of it. It was touched on briefly, but um, our ability to keep our genetic diversity um, is not only important for us to manifest in our garden, but it's also important to manifest with our shopping dollars when we go to the market. And especially if you shop at the farmer's market, um, it's very much worth seeking out those farmers who are growing some of the unusual and diverse types of um, crops that you can find around here in spades. Uh, one of uh, a well-known farmer in this area, Jerry Thomas and Josh, they grow Thelma Sanders sweet potato squash, which is um, a, started out with one of the early Seed Savers Exchange varieties and is not available in any catalogs and is definitely worth supporting those squash when you go to the market. Likewise, many of the other farmers are growing their own particular varieties um, that are worth seeking out. I just make uh, one more comment exactly in, in this line, farmer's market, um, uh, going after the apple thread here too. There's a wonderful local heirloom called My Jewel, which is actually still available at the farmer's market. It shows up in the fall and I can't remember the farmer, if somebody knows the farmer's name, um, Privadelli, I think it's Privadelli. He's got six acres of, of the My Jewel left. And what's wonderful about My Jewel is it's a, it's, a, it's an apple that actually has a banana flavor. Um, it, it's worth seeking out. And it's our own local jewel here. You cannot get it. In fact, I wrote up on a, an article on it on Wikipedia, and it got kicked off of Wikipedia because it was too obscure. So 
<laughs> yes. So, I mean, it's a real issue. So it's, it's our local treasures. And I know there's other local treasures and vegetables too. So this is really important that we do meet and find out what they are and talk amongst one another. And, and, you know, maybe we can have a fest once a year where we have like a table lined up with all the yummy things that are, that are original and being preserved within the community because people are growing it. If people aren't growing stuff, if people aren't buying them from catalogs uh, and trading them, they die out. So that is something that's completely within our power to do. And, we sh and, and really what this is all about is figuring out how we can get organized and set up the structure to do it and use existing resources as well. So just to mention a couple more of the local jewels, there's, been a, uh, there's a pineapple guava that was uh, developed right here in Santa Cruz. Uh, um, there's also uh, the Newtown Pippin, which almost went uh, w w historically in this county. Uh, at one point, they were shipping to England. It was such a popular variety. Uh, once the Granny Smith came in, it pretty much went out of favor. And, and if it wasn't for Martinelli's paying a very high price for juice, then the Pippin would be gone too. That's also listed on Slow Foods Orc of Taste. And then another, uh, the Hauer apple, which is a, a descendant of Cox's orange pippin, was developed right here in Santa Cruz. It's one of the most delicious pieces of fruit you'll ever eat, and it hangs on the tree till December. I mean, this is the kind of information we should, we should all be aware of, and, 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 and schools should be t teaching this stuff. In Wolfskill, there is a citrus collection. The rare fruit girls go there all the time. Uh, I recently was in Palier for the uh, uh, Puntia collection, the prickly pear collection. Usually people are there, are there extremely helpful. They're desperate in getting the attention of the society in the sense that they are going to be cut any moment. And they basically gave us all afternoon. I had the premier scientist, food pres uh, seed preserving scientist with all the gadgets and machines you can imagine, beautiful storage rooms. They had everything there. They had all the tools. I was just totally amazed. And I got a full day of personal attention to teach me how to do this stuff. And they begged us, basically, to ask for specimens. To, and you can do it on the web. Uh, I think you have to have an official reason. We just said we were associated with a farm, and that was good enough. Um, <laughs> and uh, you can get any variety. They mail it to us for free. Okay. Now, the rare fruit growers makes use of these things. There's many, many collections. Please use those collections before they die out and get axed in the next cut. It is not just, yeah, we have a little groovy connection here. These guys are scientists and there's a cultural barrier. We need to jump that barrier and, and ask for specimen from these people. There's also, uh, for instance, a vegetable collection in Salinas. I don't even know how to access it, but I don't know what they have, but I'm sh they collect gazillions of stuff. It's unbelievable to see. If you uh, Google the, 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 the letters GRIN, G-R-I-N, uh, and that will take you to the databases where, not only, where you can actually go into the database uh, uh, and select things and order them online and you get a U.S. government paid Federal Express package that shows up in the mail. They only do this once a year. So for example, I just got a package of Signwood about a month ago with 25 ap uh, apple varieties and they have varieties from all over the world. And just like Munfred said, they've got all kinds of collections. It's an amazing resource. It's our tax dollars at work. It's the one time when I, uh, that's the one time of the year when I get that package, you go, wow, my taxes are, are, are paying for something. I just went to Cornell this summer. Uh, that's where the uh, National Genetic Resource Base for Tomatoes is. I went into a field and saw every tomato that's been developed for the last 80 years, they had them by decades. They saved 10,000 specimens. They grow them out every seven years. There actually is a lot of government seed saving. It's a very well-established system. It's just that we don't really know about it and we don't really access it. And I wish that were different because then we could support it. We talk a lot about genet losing genetic diversity, but our government actually has a very active role in preserving it. In the tomato um, preserve, um, they are preserving the genetic resources themselves, so they preserve many, 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 all those varieties. And yes, you can request them. I honestly uh, think that you probably need to have, as you say, be, say that you're with a farm or that you're interested in uh, developing a crop of them. I don't grow seed. I would have to get a grower to grow it out. But yes, but there's a huge resource available. This actually leads into the next question, um, which is good, because it, it flows right in. 
Aside from rare fruit grower groups and the Arc of Taste program, are there other resources to learn about rare varieties available? The system that Renee was talking about is part of the National Seed uh, Storage Lab system. Uh, New York is one of five um, experiment stations throughout the country that ha has responsibility for preserving different crops that is government funded. The headquarters of it is in Fort Collins, Colorado. It's where the big seed vault is in the U.S. with controlled nitrogen storage and all of that, but they don't do any grow outs. They um, send the grow outs out to one of the five field stations of which um, New York is one, and there's one in Pullman, Washington, Savannah, Georgia, um, Hawaii. All of these can be accessed through the, uh, that GRIN program. Oh, Ames, Iowa. How could I forget? Because that's the one, I, one I've been to. Um, through that GRIN uh, database, you can access all of the um, accessions that they are willing to um, send out samples to people. However, um, they are... Um, underfunded, understaffed, and all of that stuff. And things are generally only available by accession number with no description. So if you see 3,000 tomatoes with just numbers, that's not really going to help you get a Santa Cruz adapted one. And so um, that's where uh, resources such as the Seed Savers Exchange and some of these smaller seed companies come into play. Um, the Seed Savers Exchange is the nationwide amateur group um, that they have a heritage farm in Decorah, Iowa. I'm sure you can find it on the internet. They have a seed company where all the proceeds, a nonprofit seed company where all the proceeds from selling the varieties go into maintaining the heritage farm. And they maintain the network of amateur seed savers that you can join. And you can find other seed savers, some of whom are in this area even, who um, collect and save seeds. In addition, uh, many other seed, small seed companies um, feature regionally adapted um, varieties. So uh, there's ones for most all regions of the country where you can find things that will be more adapted to your region. And then as far as um, other resources about learning about varieties, um, it was briefly brought up the Organic Seed Alliance and the farmer, Family Farmer Seed Co-op. And then um, through the website eOrganic, which is the organic version of Extension, where they have lots of um, resources about how you'd save seeds and um, how you clean seeds properly and phyto, you know, disease control and things like that. So these resources uh, very much are out there. And, um, they could stand to be all coalesced in one place and then, of course, um, made regionally appropriate if someone's going to focus on this particular region. There is, there is one book out there that you absolutely have to get. It's called Cornucopia. The one you actually, uh, Munfred will maybe pass it around. Cornucopia 2 is actually the one you're looking for. I don't know which one he has. This is an amazing book that has the, what the guy tried to do is he tried to actually uh, catalog every variety of vegetables and fruit around. Um, and he didn't just stop at vegetables and fruit. He's got sourdoughs in there and yogurt cultures. So it's quite amazing. It's a great resource from the perspective. The, the resources as to where to buy them are way out of date, so you won't get anywhere there. But as far as finding out, wow, this, is a, this variety grows well here or this is what it tastes like, all that kind of stuff is, is, is in there. So. And I'll just mention one more. Uh, it's called Raft, Renewing American Food Traditions. Uh, it was Gary Nabhan who wrote a book called Enduring Seed, as well as some other great books. Um, worked with Slow Food and um, put together a list of, I think, 400 foods that was really the expression of the confluence of cultures of um, Native American, African, European. So going back 400 years, 500 years, what the, what the, the food tradition was and, and and how much of that has been lost. So that's uh, raft or renewing American food traditions.